as we're talking about what does it look like to prepare the way, right? what does it mean to say, Jesus, we want to be, be a people prepared who are prepared for you to come, come to us and come through us into this world, right? So last week we started in Mark's gospel, right? We're looking at all four of those gospels and asking, how does that gospel writer call us to prepare the way for Jesus? And so we looked at Mark's, and do you happen to remember, those who were here, what does Mark do with the nativity story? He skips it. Ah, That's when they listen. Did you take note? I did. He's my boss. We looked at Mark's gospel, right? And Mark, he just skips it. He doesn't talk about Bethlehem. He doesn't talk about Mary and Joseph. He doesn't talk about anything, right? He skips all of the story so that we don't miss the point, right? And Mark said the only thing you get in his, uh, his whole gospel about Jesus' birth is it's the beginning of the good news, right? It's the beginning. It's the moment where it changed everything. You had before Christ, and then you have everything else. And we talked about what does it look like as a people, this Advent, to say, well, we're going to skip it. We're going to skip some of the extra stuff so that we don't miss the point. So the people around us don't miss the point that because Jesus came, everything has changed. And I got to brag on a couple people. Social media sometimes has some perks. You might not like it, though. Oh, here we go. This isn't bad. Right? We talked last week about what's it look like to skip the gifts in order to give the gift, right? To say, uh, I'm going to scale back on how much money I I spend on purchasing gifts to intentionally bless others. So this is a post that Devin uh, put on Facebook yesterday. She and Lisa together uh, adopted, according to this, uh, Randall, right? He's one of the little boys, a four-year-old, that we're adopting as a church, right? And so Devin putting on Facebook, uh, this is why I did it. And that invitation to say, I'm going to spend a little bit less at home because there's a a mom out there who can't afford warm clothes for her four-year-old. Last night, uh, another picture showed up. Jamie's Jamie's currently hitting bear. Right? Because one of the things we talked about as well was saying, well, what does it look like to skip some of the stress that comes with Advent in order to say, Lord, we want to build and make the space to encounter you? And so this amazing invitation, right, and in this case, the Minnick family sitting down at dinner and going through the devotional that we set aside as a church to make that time, say, let's talk as a family. Guys, what's Jesus doing in our lives? I show you these because I like to brag, but I also show you these things because that's part of how we skip it, right? We make this space for our God. Well, this Sunday, we're just going to keep going, right? So we were in Mark's gospel last week, we're going to be Matthew's gospel this week. So I'd ask you to go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we're going to start at verse 1. Now Matthew, he does not skip the nativity story. As a matter of fact, it's in Matthew's gospel that we get uh, Joseph, right, and the angel coming to Joseph in the middle of the night and telling him it's, it's okay, you, you can marry Mary and you can adopt uh, this little boy that, that she's going to have. It's in Matthew's gospel that we learn about the wise men or the magi coming. We get some of our favorite pieces of the Christmas story, but we're not going there because to prepare the way, Matthew starts somewhere else. Have you made it to Matthew 1 yet? Are you afraid I'm about to read this list? <laughs> Some of you are. I got an MDiv. You got to put it to practice for something. That's really all that is. We learned how to pronounce these names, right, Jen? Thought so. Matthew chapter 1, if you're there, right, is this list of names. A long list of names, friends. It's got more than 40 names, all of them repeated twice. So that's 80 by the time you're all done. And in this long list of names... Matthew tells us what we need to do to prepare the way for Jesus to come. Mark says, skip it. Matthew says, name it. Now, I'm not going to read all of these names to us today. I know you're very sad and disappointed. But I am going to throw them up here on the screen so we can take a look at them for a minute. And I ask you to go ahead and keep your Bibles open because we will be coming back here. We're just not going to read the names. See, the truth of the matter is, Aaliyah, when when Matthew's gospel was first read to its first readers, and it was opened up, right? The people read it the first time, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then they started down this long list of names. That My guess is, when the first readers heard it, Gail, their eyes did not glaze over like ours do. 
They didn't trip over the names and go, well, that's a really unfortunate one. Who named their kid Salmon? <laughs> I'm just saying. I think that every time. I guess, my guess, guys, is that they looked at that list of names and they said, there's real significance in who Matthew includes and who he doesn't. See, the truth is, Julia, that there's more names. There's actually more names from Abraham all the way down to Joseph and Mary. Matthew doesn't include them all. A part of that was a device made it really easy to memorize, in case you get bored and you ever want to memorize this. But part of it, too, is that Matthew was very intentional. What names showed up? He had to make a choice. Some of them left, even though he included so great many. So that means that when Matthew wrote this name and he put every one of these names down at this list and you know which name comes last, right? Jesus. It was on purpose. He's naming specific people. And when he puts the specific names in the list, I mean, part of it is the historical genealogy. Part of it is just about proving that Jesus is the son of Abraham and the son of David. But there's more to it than that. When he names each one of these names that's on here, he's pointing to the last name, to the why of the last name. Brandon, it's like he's saying, every one of these names has to be here because they're what's prepared the way for Jesus to come. So let's think about this for a minute. See, when, when the first people heard this and they knew all those names, right? Matthew's mostly writing to Jewish people, so they probably already had this memorized and could recite it. When he's writing this list to them, they went, hey, wait a minute, there's something cool about this list. So, for instance, if you look at this list, the names I highlighted in yellow, they're kind of a random selection, but my guess is you know them all. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Boaz, David, Solomon. These are the heroes of the faith, right? If you grew up in Sunday school, you were made to dress up like most of those people at some point. We talk about those names. They're Bible characters everybody knows. What about these guys over here? Azor, Zadok, Akim, Eliud, I don't know how you say a couple of them. Ever heard of them? I didn't think so. Outside of Matthew chapter 1, neither have I. You know, you get the heroes on the one end, but you also get included in this list of names the unheard of. People who nobody knows their stories. Nobody remembers them. We don't have Bible stories about them, but they're still on that list. Both sets of names. Both sets of names prepare the way for Jesus to come. Well, who else is up there? You know, everyone in white, they're men, right? All the ones that we just turned to yellow, though, those are women. And, and Leslie, that's not normal. In a, in a Jewish genealogy, you just went, this man had this one as his son who had this person as his son. You don't put women in the list. But when Matthew was putting his genealogy together, he said, no, 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 it took both. <laughs> and there's a couple women in here who need to be kept. So you need both men and women as we're preparing the way. Everyone in white, they're Jewish. But you know there's two names up here, Rahab and Ruth. They're Gentiles. They don't belong there. I mean, Rahab, let's, let's just be real here, right? Uh, Rahab was the prostitute who was a Canaanite. And if you've read your Old Testament, you know that pretty much anything that ends with it, we, they were bad, right? And the Canaanites, they're the worst. Rahab's a Canaanite prostitute who gets to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Her name's on the list. Ruth, she's a Moabite. And the Old Testament law said that because of the way the Moabite people had treated God and his people, that for ten solid generations they were to be excluded from God's people, utterly unable to become a follower. And you get Ruth, who happens to be a Moabite, who is the great-grandma of King David and the great-great-great-grandma of Jesus Christ. So when they heard this list, I think those are probably some of the things that would have gone in their minds. They went, wait a minute, we've got heroes in the unheard of. We've got men and women. We've got Jews and we've got Gentiles. But I bet they heard a few other things that got named as well. So, for instance, the, the, the guys that I made blue here, you know, most of their story, most of their story is about passionately pursuing the Lord. That's why we know them. 
Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Boaz and Ruth, even David, and all the way down to Joseph and Mary, right? Theirs is a story of a people who didn't do it perfectly by any stretch of the imagination, but a people who loved the Lord. And so they followed him where he asked that they go. They, they sought to obey him with their lives. So it makes sense that they're named. But the folks in red, like Ahaz and Ammon and Jeconiah and Joram, you know, their stories in Scripture are stories of just flat-out rebels. I mean, Jeconiah, right? He's a, he was a king uh, over the people of Judah. And the Lord says to him, Jeconiah, if you were a ring on my finger, I would rip you off and throw you away. Okay, that's Jeconiah's story. He wasn't a good guy. When um, Joram died, Scripture says he died to no one's regret. Everybody was like doing a little jig on that man's grave. He wasn't a good man. Some of the people are like Uzziah. Uzziah gets half and half. When Uzziah was really young, he had uh, a really good pastor who, who mentored him and discipled him. We'd say shepherded him, right? And so Uzziah grew up following the Lord, but when the pastor died, it turns out he wasn't actually following the Lord. He was following the pastor. And Uzziah went totally the opposite direction. He dies uh, cut off from God. Manasseh, he's got the opposite story. Right? Manasseh starts off, and that man's awful. I mean, he sacrifices his children for his own gain, and, and I don't mean that figuratively. The man sacrificed his children because he thought it would help him. Midway in his life, Manasseh hits rock bottom, and he finally discovers that God's always been there, always loved him, and would always welcome him back. And the second part of Manasseh's life is the life of a reformer who is doing everything to pursue God. Both sets of names, though, they show up in this list of names. The people whose story is one of following the Lord and the people whose story is, is a total opposite. But you get a couple other things in this name list, too. For instance, the names in blue, right, that's the names of people whose scripture talks about, uh, really explicitly, the ways that they hurt other people. So, Abraham. Good old father Abraham. Abraham uh, more than once put his wife in a situation where she was going to physically and sexually be harmed because it was going to cover his own butt. Isaac, he and his wife had such extreme favoritism with their sons that it led to what we would today call one very dysfunctional family. <laughs> Jacob was a liar and a cheater and a schemer at everything that you looked at to the point that he didn't care if he was lying to his dad, if he was lying to his brother. He'd lie to anybody about anything. They hurt people. David you know David's story, right? David was a man after God's own heart who looked at a woman and decided, I will have her. I was reading some commentaries for this week and they talked about Bathsheba and they just said she's an adulteress. And all I could think was, if the king says to the woman whose husband is so far away he couldn't protect her if he wanted to, you come now. I'm not sure we call that consensual. So I'm not sure that David is an adulterer. I think David's a rapist. And you know what happens, right? You keep reading David's life story. He had sinned to such an egregious amount that when his own son rapes his daughter, David's daughter, David won't say a word. It's like David feels like if I did it and I messed up this much, how can I correct you? David's whole family splits. It goes crazy because of the harm that man caused. The ladies in red, Tamar, Bathsheba, you know, theirs is a story of being hurt, of being the people uh, who were mistreated in some really awful ways. And we could keep going down the list, but I didn't think we wanted to go through all 41 names. The bottom line is that when you look at this list of names, there's a whole lot more to them than just things we can't pronounce. We had a list of names of people that we know and we don't know, of men and of women, of Jews and of Gentiles, of people that, for the most part, we would lump their life as pretty good, people that, for the most part, we would lump their life as not so good. 
people who have caused a lot of harm and people who have been hurt. And every one of them is named. Every one of them. Bear, I think Matthew chose these names because he said every one of those names has to be there in order to prepare the way for the last name. If we're going to get to Jesus, we're going to name him, then every one of those names has to be there first. Now, from a practical reason, Eric, it's because it's grandpa and then grandson and then son, right? From a theological reason, it's because every one of those names needs to be there. None of them are so good that they could just be taken off. None of them are so bad that they couldn't be included. And every one of those names, they point to Jesus' name. You see, it's his name that changes everything. And that's where Matthew goes, right? So let's go down to verse 21 of Matthew 1. We'll skip over all of everybody else's names, but let's pick up on Jesus' name. Because the next thing that takes place after this long genealogy is that Matthew begins to narrate, he begins to talk about the night that Joseph, Joseph was wrestling, right? Joseph had found out that Mary was pregnant and, uh, and they were betrothed, right? So that was engagement on steroids. They'd made a covenant to each other. They were married. They just weren't living together yet. So when he finds out that Mary is pregnant, we have a problem. So in Matthew 1, he says that Joseph was really wrestling, and he was saying, Lord, I can't marry this woman. As far as Matthew, or as far as Joseph was concerned, Mary had committed adultery. How else was the woman pregnant? And so he's planning, how do I divorce her in a way that's quiet, in a way that doesn't involve her getting stoned, but also doesn't involve a big scandal that drags me into it, too? And you know the story, right? Um, when he's asleep, an angel comes to him in a dream and says, Joseph! It's okay. <laughs> Mary is, in fact, pregnant, but she's pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and you can take her, and you can be wedded to her. And then the angel speaks this, in verse 21. He says, Mary's going to give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You're to name him Jesus. You know what Jesus means? And Jesus was a, a really common name in, in the New Testament era. It'd be like naming somebody Bob today. Everybody is. It was a very common name because of what it meant. In Greek, the word uh, Jesus, right, that's what we translate as Jesus, means Yahweh saves. Yahweh, right, the covenant name of God, the name by which he defines himself and declares himself to us as the great I am. I am saves. So who wouldn't want to name their little boy that? It's this declaration of what God is and what God's going to do. But actually, when the angel speaks to Joseph, he says, we need clarity here. <laughs> Yahweh's going to save. Yahweh's going to save his people from their sins. It's going to be real specific, the salvation that he's bringing. So Chris, the angel looks at Joseph, and he says to him, you name this baby boy when he comes. You name him, Yahweh saves. The day that Jesus was born, it was like a war cry went out, <laughs> not just the baby's cry. Right? This declaration from God that said, I will save my people from their sins. Now, they thought he was coming to save their people from all their struggles and all their problems and from an oppressive government, but he said, that was never my intention. I will do that later. That's why we're still in Advent, and we wait for a second coming. But with his first Ada, the Lord said, I'll save my people from their sins. You know, that has profound implications. When Jesus came, he said, I'm going to save my people from the guilt and shame of their sin. You know, when he takes it away, he takes away the guilt and the shame. I'm going to save my people from the pain of the sin that they've caused and the pain of sin that's caused to them. I'm going to save my people uh, from the cycle of sin, you know, the bondage that we just get into, whether it's my own cycle or it's the generation of my grandma did it and then mom did it and now here I am. When Jesus came 
and that Lord spoke this name over him. Guys, the last name on the list is the name that says, I will save my people from every bit of their sin, completely and totally. That's why all the other names needed to be there. You see, every one of those names, they tell us that there is not a person who doesn't need someone to save them from their sins. None of them. Not the ones that we would look at and say, they're pretty good. They weren't perfect. And there's not a single name up there that we have to look at and say, he's a murderer and a rapist. He needs off the list. David's still one of the names. He's still one of the names that needs a savior who can save him from his sins. Just like Bathsheba needs one who can save her from the impact of what David did. Every single name that's up there points to Jesus. Every name that's up there says, I need a savior. And his name says, I've come. I'm here. And my promise is I'm the God who saves. You know, we have a God who has declared salvation from Genesis all the way to Revelation, but his salvation begins in this. Every time for every person. Every time I want to be saved from guilt, then I need to be saved from the sin that caused me that. Every time I want to be saved from shame, then I say, Lord, I need you to save me from what this person did that has caused me shame. Every time I want to be saved from becoming just like my mama and doing the same sin pattern that she's been doing because she learned it from her mom, who I suppose learned it from hers, I come right down to I need to be saved from this sin. And here's the amazing promise of the gospel. Jesus came. The one who said, I save you, he's already done it. The only thing that has to take place for salvation to be experienced is we got to prepare the way. And we're going to do it the same way that Matthew did. We got to name it. As a matter of fact, I would argue that we need to break it down into three real quick steps. We got to name us. Then we got to name the sin. And then we need to name Jesus. I want you to just think about what I mean. It's one thing to look at this list of names and say, yep, they did bad things. Good thing they're on that list. It's another thing to put our own names. But if I'm going to be set free and I'm going to know Jesus Christ is my Savior, then I have to agree with him that my name goes on the list. I am not so good that I am exempt. Now, I might think I am some days, but I'm not. Nor am I so bad or things done to me so bad or lasted so long that my name can't be on that list. You want to know Jesus Christ as Savior, you got to start here with this agreement with our God that my name belongs there. And all that means is coming before my Savior, and this is not a once and done. It's an every time I'm struggling and saying, Jesus, right now, I need a Savior. Put my name on the list. we got to name ourselves, but then we also have need to name our sin, right? It's not enough to say, Jesus, I'm a savior. I need to say, Jesus, I struggle with apathy. Lord, my sin is self-loathing. I'm a liar. In that one instance right there, I totally want to just call this a fib, but it was a lie. We had to name our sin. Some of us, uh, we have it in our heads, my sin's not that big a deal. Your Savior did not put an asterisk after his name. I came to save people from their big sins. Nor did he say, I saved them from socially acceptable ones. Any sin. And every sin. And here's the hope of the gospel. Did you know that if you can call something sin, you can be saved from it? Let me be really clear. Here is what the angel did not say. He did not say, Joseph. Can you name him Jesus? Because God wants to save his people from their mistakes, their flub-ups, their personalities, um, their dysfunction. He said, I want to save people from their sin. Sin's a technical term. Sin means to miss God's mark. And if I call it sin, if I say, Lord, the temper tantrum I am currently throwing is sin. And I do not come before the Lord and say, but I am totally justified for the following 27 reasons. It's just sin. Did you know I can be saved from that? 
That means there isn't condemnation in putting my name. There isn't condemnation in naming my sin. There is freedom. And there is hope. Because naming me and naming my sin is what prepares the way for the Savior to come. Period. Skip the first two steps. He cannot come. That's all it takes. That means the first time that I encounter Jesus and I name myself and I name my sin, he forgives. But it also means today. I, we talked about this last week. Uh, I was a Christian. I've been a Christian for 27 years. And today, I'm going to need to come before Jesus and say, Jesus, my name goes on the list. And my sin today is pride. And he'll set me free today. Because my Savior happens to work under this same mission statement that we do, right? This constant bringing us messy, broken people towards holiness and wholeness through the power of his name. You don't get set free from these sins by hard work. You don't get set free from these sins by just gritting your teeth. We get set free by naming us, naming the sin, and then naming the name that sets us free. You can't skip any of those steps, guys. Because to name Jesus is to declare, Yahweh, I need saved. And you promised to do it. I need set free. I, I want to know what it is to no longer walk in this bondage. The most exciting moment you have in your relationship with Jesus Christ is naming your sin. Because that's when things start to change. The second we do it. Some of us are so busy believing my name can't go on the list or my sin shouldn't be said out loud or how dare you call what I'm doing sin that we never get to this part. We don't get to name Jesus. Call that name and be set free. Today, we'll, as we talked in worship subgroup about what we wanted to do today, we said we wanted to give everybody the opportunity to prepare the way. To prepare individually and prepare corporately for our Savior to come and bring salvation. You know, every time God's people come before him and we name ourselves, we name our sin, and we name him, revival gets to break out. Because the day that we do that is the day Jesus says, okay, <laughs> I'm going to live up to my name, and I'll save you today from your sins. All around this room, uh, you'll see green tables with uh, white cloths and, and some Sharpie markers on it. And here's what I want to ask you to do. We're going to start to play some music here in just a few moments. I'm going to ask you to, I want you to ask the Lord today, what's the sin you want me to name? If you have asked God's forgiveness for sin that you just feel like it's really safe and you can keep asking forgiveness for that, let's move on to today. What is today our Savior saying to you, I want to set you free? What we're going to invite you to do is to name you and name the sin by going back to one of those tables, and I just want you to write the sin down. You don't need to write your name beside it. You don't have to sign your autograph to it. Jesus knows by your going, you just named you. By you writing it down, writing down that sin, we're naming it before our God. And what we're going to do is to take each one of those pieces and make them a blanket. We're going to put that blanket right here on the creche. You know, when moms and dads get pregnant and they're waiting for the baby to come, they get a couple things ready. They get a name. They get some blankets, and they get ready to receive their baby. And we're going to do the same thing as that symbol that says we're preparing the way for our Savior to come. So we're going to ask Mr. Brandon if he'd go ahead and start some music for us. And as you're ready, go to each one of those, one of those tables, name yourself by going, name your sin by writing it, and then invite you to come back. And as you're sitting in your pew, start naming Jesus. Ask him to be the one who saves.